Hello? 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 Hello everyone, we're gonna start in a few minutes, uh, just around at one, sharp. We are going to talk about um, the ins and out of an AdSys application. So uh, that's basically what we're doing today. Let me... Once we start, uh, so I see that Farah Kasimovo has joined. Hi, Farah. Thanks for joining. Let's wait for a few more people to join and then we can get started. Where are you calling in from, Farah? You change that, you change. Nice access and vacation. Should call it the ins and outs of of the access application and should save it by that. That should work. All right, so you're calling in from Virginia. Nice, nice. I'm calling in from Connecticut. I am going to start within a few more minutes. Let's just give a few more minutes for other people to join. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, this this is the whole idea that um, we're going to go over the AdSys application. I'm going to start very soon. As soon as a few people start joining, I'm going to start the, the webinar. Alrighty, I'm all set and ready to go. Maybe in one more minute, I'm gonna start talking about the the AdSys application. Just give me one more minute, and I'm gonna start talking uh, about the AdSys application. Let's you know let's 
uh, let us allow a few more people to join. I see a, uh, a few people joined already. So when, once that happens, we'll get started with the application, uh, access application. Okay, so moving out down to the coach. <coughs> And Farah, if you have any question that you want to ask during the webinar, you can go ahead and type that in the chat box. I'm regularly checking the chat box so that I can um, answer your question in the meantime. Alrighty, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I see another person has joined. Uh, so hi, who, whoever joined, can you type in the chat box where you're calling in from? And thanks for joining in this live webinar. Really appreciate it, uh, the taking the time out on a Saturday to join the live webinar. I know it's, a, it's not the most convenient time for everyone, uh, but you know, thanks for joining. I'm gonna start going ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and start recording so that if any time you wanna watch it later, it will be available on YouTube. So let me start recording this. And let me bring out the presentation. I think you'll really like this presentation. Um, so once the presentation loads into the webinar, we can get it started and talking about the access application. Hi, Justina is calling in from California. Hi, Justina. <sighs> okay, so let me check if the... Okay. So hi everyone, thanks for joining. I know that it isn't a mini, it isn't many people yet who joined, but I'm gonna go ahead and start just for the sake of time and for um, for whoever you know whoever joined on the call. So if any time you have any question, type it in the chat box so we can see what questions you may have about. Um, oh. Someone just texted me saying that they could not type it in the chat box. Um, that's interesting. All right, so in that case, you can just text me and I can answer your question on, um, I, can, I, can I can mention your question during, um, during the webinar. All right, so this is this is just for my private students and also people on my on my email list. I'm not broadcasting this to the public. I have not uh, mentioned that on my you know on the website yet uh, because I want to make sure that I um, address the questions that my students and my email list uh, students have. So let's jump right in and discuss the ins and outs of AdSense application. We're gonna go very detailed. We're gonna go into detail about the AdSense application because I feel that uh, there are a few questions that appear regularly among my students and I want to address those questions. I also want to um, you know, kind of talk about some of, the, some of the caveats to the application and what are some of the you know, loopholes that the application has. So let's jump right in and discuss who the heck you know is the dental school coach? So I think it's very important that you know who I am right now. So my name is Zia, and I you know my full name is Mohammed Zia. Then I go by Zia. That's my nickname. I am a graduate of UPenn. I graduated in 2013, and I got accepted to five schools. 
New York, New York University, UPenn, UCSF, Rutgers, and Pittsburgh uh, in 2013 cycle. And I was supposed to start dental school in that year, but my mother became really, really sick and I had to step out of dental school and take a job. So currently I'm working as, an, uh, as a healthcare consultant uh, in New York City and Connecticut. And in the, in this, at the same time, I realized that a lot of students were reaching out to me for help, uh, for specifically you know, getting into dental school. So I started Dental School Coach in 2014. And over the last three years, I have coached about 400 plus students, 400 plus pre-dental students, you know, via you know, either paid students or unpaid students, uh, 400 plus. And my success rate for uh, get, getting acceptance to dental school is about 97%. It changes every year. So I think last year was about 96%. Um, a few of my students were waitlisted and they're still being, uh, they're still waiting to hear back from uh, the schools. Um, and you can, you can see in the next slide uh, the many schools that my students got accepted to, but you know, Harvard, Penn Columbia, and UCSF are some of the prestigious schools that my students got accepted to. So I'm really proud of them. And um, and if your dream is to get into those schools, definitely, you know, let me know and I can, def I can help you out. Um, <clears throat> Alrighty, so if you have any question in the meantime, type it in the chat box. Uh, and thanks for, thanks for joining in the webinar. Really, really appreciate your call uh, today. So, so the next slide, I'm gonna go to the next slide and show you what are some of the schools that my students got accepted to. And, and this is important uh, to show you because I want you to, I, you know, I want you to believe that you can get accepted to dental school. It's, um, it's possible. Even if you're applying to, uh, you know, with a low GPA and low DAT, it's quite, ex you know, it's quite possible to get accepted to one of the schools that I am showing here on the, on the list. And, um, you know, I have a student who got accepted to Midwestern Illinois with a 2.9 GPA or even ESDO with a 2.9 GPA. So, you know, if you have a low GPA, don't, you know, don't lose hope. Uh, you know, work with me to understand what you need to do to improve your chances at, at uh, the access application. Um, you know, I always say that you have to, you don't have, you don't have to do it alone. You can always take help. So here are some more uh, students who are talking about me. Uh, you know, I just, I just put it up there so that you can see what are some of the, you know, what are some of the benefits of working with me and how I work with them, what, with my students. Uh, here are a few more. I'm gonna hang it out, hang it out there for about a few seconds, and then <coughs> this is uh, all about access application. So I'm on the slide uh, about access application. I know that um, I know that. It's, it's a very important piece of the puzzle of getting to dental school, and I want to make sure that by the end of this webinar, uh, you know, by 2.30 my time, uh, which is in 90, almost in 90 minutes or 80 minutes, I want you to be clear as to what you need to do on the access application so that you are most prepared to apply to dental school and you have all the backup and support uh, while you are applying to dental school. <coughs> all right. So... For those of you who are on the webinar, um, I have created a fake profile, uh, so you know, to, so as to demonstrate what are some of the things you need to use in the, you know, what are some of the things you need to have on your application. The main part, main four parts are your personal information, your academic history, your supporting information, and program materials. So today I'm going to discuss. Uh, details about the three topics, the personal information, the academic history, and supporting information. I'm also going to go into the program materials, but I'm probably not going to be able to cover all the schools that are in the access uh, school list, but I'll discuss a few things that you should know about the application. And this is a new, new application that ADS has opened up this year, so the website is brand new. Look, it looks like, a, it looks like much better than what I had to go through in 2012-2013 cycle. So, you know, definitely it's, it's a much better website, much faster, and does a lot of things better than the last five years ago, or even last year. Um, so let's go into details about personal information. <coughs> personal information is a lot of yes and no question. It's very simple, very straightforward. If you're having any trouble 
uh, figuring out a specific detail about the personal, uh, you know, personal information section, shoot me an email. I'm not gonna cover it into details as you know, I want to cover the other, uh, the other uh, sections in more details. But personal information is something that I think so, you know some parts of it is important. Some parts of it are important, and I want to mention that uh, uh, in this webinar. Uh, but most of the time, it's yes and no questions and some details about about the uh, personal information. So one of the first things that I want to discuss is an oddball question. They ask about your childhood residency. <clears throat> Do you guys have any idea why they would ask you about childhood residency? Type, it in, type that in the chat box. Or if you can't type it in, that's fine. Uh, the, the reason that they're asking you about the child residency is to figure out if you're coming from a disadvantaged background. Uh, and, and they want to know if you're coming from a disadvantaged background because sometimes um, ADSES have, um, you know, have a way to select students that are coming from disadvantaged background and they want to make sure that those students' application are, um, are um, you know, they want to make sure that the, those applications are reviewed holistically, as opposed to just, be, you know, just looking at their DATS or GPA. So, if you if you are coming from a disadvantaged background, definitely mention that on your, uh, you know, on the description section of childhood residency. Show, you know, show what kind of neighborhood you are coming from and uh, the lack of access to dental care or dentists in your neighborhood. Well, let's quickly jump to the next oddball education question. So, some people do have. Um, a gap in their education and it's okay to have a gap but you need to explain why the gap happened you know if you had a, uh, a broken house where you know you had to take care of your uh, your siblings or probably you had a sick uh, parent who you had to take care of so that might cause you to you know step out of school or some other reason you know just just explain it in a in a in a uh, written format so that they understand you know you don't have to be fancy you don't have to write anything uh, you know anything fancy like your personal statement but mention that in plain simple english uh, you know in a professional tone let's talk about the manual dexterity part it's very important in the personal information section now in the manual dexterity part what they're looking for is a list of activities that you have been doing to uh, you know, to improve your manual dexterity. So, for example, some people can talk about th their sewing skills. Uh, you know, some people can talk about sculpture, painting, or you know, playing any music instrument. Those are all accepted activities that you can talk about. Anything that you can do with your hands uh, would be would be good. Now, what is the difference between your uh, manual dexterity that you have to talk about in this in this part of the application versus uh, you know the manual dexterity you should mention in your personal statement. The description here in the application um, is is going to be in a list form, but the description in the personal statement is going to be in a story format. So I gave an example here, and this is these slides are going to be available for you later. You know maybe tomorrow. Um, and you can check out this specific phrase that I pulled out from my own personal statement. Yes, fly typing and fly tying and fly fishing are fine. Uh, this this is important um, because um, uh, live music mixing. I don't think that's that's a. Uh, a a manual dexterity you can use. I'm, I'm also taking question from text and also from the live chat, so I'm gonna be responding to them, you know, during the call. So, uh, you know, it might be a bit out of uh, context, but uh, let's go back to manual dexterity. You can check how I talk about manual dexterity on my personal statement, very, uh, very personalized, you know, very in detail about what I built and what I've created in a very passionate format. The reason is that you know personal statement is very personal. You're going to talk about uh, you know your feelings and you're going to talk about emotions, stuff like that. You know that uh, emotions and feelings should not be in your uh, access application. However, 
they should be in your personal statement, but not in the in the application. You should talk about, uh, you know, in a descript descriptive format what you have done. So, uh, play, playing musical instruments, uh, taking you know, picking up a sculpture, picking up painting, stuff like that would be appropriate. Alrighty, so. Next is um, a section for reapplicants, which is quite important, and I want to go into that in details. Uh, if you're not a reapplicant, you can zone out for a few seconds. But if you are a reapplicant, in the activities section, you are going to talk about whether you have, you know, you plan to retake the DAT or you have, whether you have already taken the DAT again to improve your chances, uh, whether you have done more shadowing, more volunteering, more clinical activities, stuff like that, um, and you know whether you have take wh whether you have picked up a skill to improve your manual dexterity um all right so also for reapplicants there is a you know the reapplicant essay does not mean that you should not talk about being a reapplicant on your personal statement and i mentioned that to re to my students repeatedly because some students do ask, you know, what is the difference between the reapplicant essay versus talking about reapplicant, uh, talking about being a reapplicant in your personal statement? The difference is that the personal statement is very personal versus the reapplicant essay is slightly impersonal. You can talk about a list of activities that you are doing in the reapplicant essay, uh, and you know, you don't you don't have to mention anything uh, emotional or personal. Uh, in the reapplicant essay, but again, for the personal statement, you have to make it more personal for you. You have to give a specific example of your uh, of your work that you have been doing since last application, and also you have to ban you know it's better to mention a case study. I gave an example right here. It's a very rudimentary example of what you should type in in your personal statement versus uh, what you should do in your reapplicant essay. In your reapplicant essay, you can talk about in a list format. It's mentioned that you know. I am, uh, you know, retaking the DAT. I am, you know, taking more classes at my uh, at my college uh, to improve my chances. Or you can say I'm, you know, doing a master's program that uh, that will be improving my chances to get into dental school. Uh, you can also say that uh, I've been joining X Y Z organization to, you know, to learn more about, uh, you know, clinical dentistry or learn more about uh, clinical dentistry in a in a rural, uh, for you know. In, in the rural town of Missouri, I don't know, like something, something that you're doing in a li list format, uh, and the, and for the personal statement, keep it personal. Make it, make it more about your passion for dentistry. Make it more about your path, you know, your path to dentistry. All right. So if you're not a reapplicant, I think, um, and you're you're looking to get a refund. So some some students do apply for. Uh, access application and they might see that, uh, you know, they might feel that, oh, I don't apply to uh, dental school anymore. You can ask for a refund within the 30 days of applying after you submit your application. Or if you're a reapplicant, you can ask for a refund within, uh, within two weeks of getting accepted by a dental school. So for example, if you're waitlisted at NYU and you got accepted by uh, July 7th, you have two weeks to reach out to access if you have you know applied the second time or the third time, you have that two weeks to ask for a refund. Given that you're gonna you know you're gonna go to NYU or whatever school you're waitlisted at. All right, let's you know this is all about personal information section. If you have any more question, you know this is the time to type it in the chat box or text me uh, your question so I can answer them right now. And if you do not have any question about the personal information section, I'm gonna move to the supporting information section because I feel that it's it's quite important. So so Justina is asking if it's better to take a gap year or and apply earlier, not taking a gap year, uh, but apply late June or July. That's a very good question. Um, Applying late in June, July is fine. You know, you're you're gonna get accepted to dental school if you have a good GPA and good DAT. So far, you know, Ju I, I would recommend applying by June if you're serious about applying. But taking a gap year, um, it has to be meaningful. So, for example, you can take a gap year because you are doing something productive in the in the year. For example, you know, using that year to take a you know do a master's program, uh, using that year to take more courses in your 
uh, in your postgraduate program or postback program to improve your GPA. Uh, if you feel, you know, if your GPA is low on the lower end, so anything lower than 3.2, I'd say, you know, may maybe that is a good idea to do, take a year off, uh, or if your DAT is lower than a 19 or 18, I recommend taking a year off and kind of like, Re, you know, take some courses, improve your GPA, and then apply in the next cycle. But if you feel that you have a good shot in getting into dental school, if your GPA is above 3.2, 3.3-ish, uh, and your, your DAT is above 19, I think you have a good shot at applying. It doesn't matter uh, if you apply in June or July. It's still early. Uh, I would say end of July is, is when it's it gets to kind of the late phase. Uh, even then, I've seen get, students getting accepted after they applied in September or, or even October. I did a in, I did an interview with a student who applied in November and December uh, of last year and she still got accepted to Toro. Um, that was a, you know, I, I thought that was a miracle, but I think as long as you have a good GPA and a good DAT score, you should be able to get accepted uh, even if you're applying in July. All right, any more question? This is the time to ask for anything personal information related. <coughs> One of my students is asking about uh, being a dental assistant and if that improves his or her chances. Um, so, her, you know, his or her question is, does becoming a dental assistant be increase my chances of getting accepted to dental school because I have been offered a job, but my current job uh, pays more? Any advice would be helpful. Look, anything uh, d related to dental assisting would help your application, but um, it doesn't have to be that, you know, you have to be a dental assistant to get into dental school. I wasn't, a, you know, I was not a dental assistant when I applied to dental school. It, it does give you some edge. You're going to know more stuff than your peers that are coming out of undergraduate. Um, but I feel that, you know, being a dental assistant is something that you should you should do if you're passionate about the about the field and you want to learn more on a daily to daily basis. But if you have other options which is going to pay you more, uh, you know, you can take that as long as you're continuing to do shadowing, continuing to do your observation um, with the dentist and also, you know, doing your volunteering. So, you know, it's, it's fine to do other things aside from your job. You don't have to be a dental assistant, but if, you're, if you are a dental assistant, it does, it does imp improve your chances, but not to a significant extent. You still have to have volunteering hours, you still have to have observation hours, um, and you, you also need to have a good GPA and good DAT. All right, so let's move to the supporting information. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the experience. A lot of the time, uh, experience can be misidentified or, um, you know, like maybe not written in the right format. So I want to make sure that you know the details and the um, the definitions provided by the ADEA uh, of what experience they're looking for. So for example, in terms of the experiences, they are defining it by a uh, few categories. So academic enrichment is a program, like a supplemental master's program, or a summer medical program, etc. Dental shadowing is a time spent, you know, uh, following and observing at a dental office. Now, if, if you are a dental assistant, I don't think you have a space for writing that in the application because in the employment section, so if you go to the employment, uh, which is right here in the middle, in the, uh, right in the middle, and the employment, it says paid work done outside of the dental care field. For example, non-dental related healthcare experience, retail or restaurant job. So those are the employ employment options that you have. So if you are a dental assistant, um, and you want to mention that on your application, it, it's going to go into the dental shadowing part just because, you know, employment in terms of ADEA is something that they're looking for outside of dental related field. And that might be confusing and it was confusing to me in the beginning, but I, I, uh, I had to understand why they're doing it. They're kind of trying to separate employment from dental related employment or shadowing. So if you are a dental assistant right now, or if you have a job at a dental office, uh, you know, make sure that you mention it in the dental shadowing part instead of at the employment part. Extracurricular activities. Um, I mean, it's pretty simple, straightforward. You know, it doesn't have to be a sports team or, you know, community service, volunteer activities. Um, yes, you can say if you're a CDA. So, for example, if you're a certified dental assistant, you can definitely mention that in your application. 
Uh, a certified dental assistant is in the licensing section and I'm gonna go into details about that. Yes. Um, so if you do not have a certification, you cannot say that you have, you know, you are, you are a certified dental assistant. You, if, you, if you are a dental assistant who does not have a license, it's better to mention that in the dental sharing part. Um, if you, so some states require you to have a license become, before becoming a, uh, a certified dental assistant and some, some states don't require you to have a license. So make sure that you, know, you are clear on if you, whether you have a license or not. So I'm going back to the dental shadowing part and talking about the certification part. All right, so research activities. Now, in the research part, I wanna make sure one thing is very clear. If your research is a, uh, a research that you're doing as a part of a class, so if you're doing a research for three credit, credits or four credits, uh, you're not going to be able to put it on the research section here, in the experience research section. If you're doing an unpaid research or a paid research, you can put it on the experience section. Um, but if you are taking a class for research, you should not put it down as research. And for volunteer services, um, now if you're doing something volunteering outside of healthcare, like Habitat for Humanity, tutoring students, this should go here. Now, this, this section, uh, and I'm also linking the website below, this should be a good example and you know, it should be a good uh, baseline for you to understand what experiences you should include and what experiences you're gonna take out. All right, so with that said, let's, let's move to the next section. A lot of people are asking me, what should we put down in the description section of the experience and in the in the description section make sure you put down um, you know make sure you put down something that you have done so <clears throat> excuse me unlike the personal statement and I, I, I refer back to the personal statement because you may have talked about this experience in the personal statement and I want to understand that you know your personal statement is um, you know, I also, I also want to understand that your personal statement is different from your description. So your description is going to be a, a list format. What have you done? Observed XYZ procedure at the dental office, if you're talking about shadowing. Or, you know, you have done XYZ at the, at the emergency room that you have shadowed or volunteered at. Um, and the second thing you should talk about is what did you learn from the experience? For, so, for example, I learned about uh, building long-term relationship. Uh, with patients or I learned about systemic oral health something like that or talk about you know how dentistry is practiced in a corporate setting so if you're if you are practicing or if you, sorry if you're observing at a dental office in um, in a corporate setting you should talk about you know how what is the difference that you have seen uh, versus in a private practice you can also talk about um, you know other things so for example uh, if you're working in a in a job so, sorry, for example, if you're working at a job where it requires you to work in a team, you can talk about the value of teamwork that you have learned, or you could, uh, you know, you could uh, show that you're working to manage a project with the team. You know, experiences like that would be important as a dentist because dentists are sometimes working in a, in a you know, in a larger team, so in a, in a team of four or five people with the, uh, in the, within the office. So you should mention anything that relates to dentistry. So in this description section, your goal would be to talk about what are some of the, you know, what are some of the activities you have done and what did you learn from those activities? And also, you know, what are, what are some of the things that, that you learned and how that, how that learning connects to dentistry. There isn't much space to be uh, creative and telling a lot of stories like your personal statement. So you have to be more descriptive. You have to tell, um, you know, you have to provide a list of things you have done. You have to, you have to provide a list of learnings you have, you have acquired through that um, activity. Now, um, in the personal statement is the place where you're gonna provide cases or stories from your experience. Versus in this experience detail section, you're gonna provide descriptions. Um, one more caveat in this is that you can talk about as many experiences as you want to, but you have to highlight six of these activities or experiences. 
and that becomes challenging if you are someone who is doing a lot of activities you have to prioritize so schools are more likely to look at the six activities that you're going to highlight on your uh, summary page which I'm going to talk about later uh, so focus on those six activities if you are uh, you know struggling to highlight the six activities you know shoot me an email and we can probably jump on a call and kind of discuss what um, what are some of the activities you should you should list out as you know your priority activities or more important activities so one of my students just texted me about um, the volunteering section so let's go back to the last slide I want to answer that as we are going through this um, as we are going through this presentation, I want to talk about um, volunteering in an emergency room. So volunteering in an emergency room is going to go into your extracurricular activities. Uh, this is, you know, this is the place to talk about your extracurricular activities. Um, the, the reason is that, you know, volunteering section is mentioned about volunteering outside of healthcare field, right? So you can't necessarily talk about it as an you know as a volunteering outside of outside of your um, outside of healthcare field so you know it could go in under extracurricular activities if you want to put it down all right hope that helps um, so achievement let's go to the achievement section let me know if you have any question type it in the chat box or text me my um, if you have my te cell phone number, text me. I'm also replying to my texts on the on this uh, webinar. So achievement. Uh, the big caveat in the achievement is that you have to highlight four achievements. Uh, so you can type in as many achievements as you want to, but you have to highlight four of them. And that becomes a challenge for uh, a lot of the students if you have a lot of academic awards, research grants, and scholarship and, and publication. So in the achievement section, I want to make sure that you are clear about some things. So look at the description uh, that ADEA provides about achievement. They said that provide information about relevant academic awards, honors, and scholarship achieved. So if you are talking about um, 10 years of learning to play the piano, it's a bad example because it's not recognized as an accomplishment by someone else or by an organization. But if you say, uh, that you are a state champion in violin uh, in 2015 in let's say new, new let's say New Jersey or some other state that's a much more accomplishment that you can put down um, so make sure you're kind of you know you're talking about who is the award given out to so you know why is the award given out so for example you know uh, let's say one of the foundations that you are competing in uh, is giving out a, an award in in violin or in a music instrument. You can talk about that, and you you should also talk about how many recipient uh, gets the award. You know how many recipients get the award in a year, and you should also mention why did you receive the award because that's more important. You know what was your accomplishment that made you get the award. Do you have any question? One thing that could be tricky about this achievement section is that uh, is that of being a published author. So if you have a research article published or uh, a research in you know non-science or science field published in an article, uh, you can talk about that either in awards or honors. You know, depending on what it fits better. Any question, type it in the chat box and I'll reply it accordingly. Let's move to the licensing part. So uh, one of the students mentioned, you know, if you have a certified dental assistant license, can you can you write that in the licensing section? Yes, you can. So for example, let me take a step back from the the presentation and go, you know, take you take you to the licensing section. So in the licensing section, I want to show you uh, what type of license you can add. So for example, if you're, you know, typing a license, uh, you have RDH, dental hygienist, dental assistant, or certified dental technician, and other licenses. You could talk about being an, you know, being an RN, um, uh, or RPH, like a pharmacist, or an MD. If you are applying to dental school after finishing those schools or being in those professions, 
And then date licenses were issued at. So you're, you're going to talk about the date that you got the license, and you have to t you know you have to upload a copy of your license. So if you are a dental assistant and you don't have a license, um, it's going to be tough for you to you know add that in here because you don't have a license to show or prove. So it's going to go into your ex experience section, and you're going to select. Uh, you're gonna select dental shadowing because employment is something that you have to sh do outside of dental work, outside of dentistry. All right, so let's go back to the to the presentation. Let me know if you have any question, and I hope this presentation is is be going to be helpful for you. Um, I'm going to take a quick step back and see who is watching right now and give you some um, um, so if you are still listening in let me know what are your questions and type them in the chat box alrighty so cover sheet this is basically um, where you're gonna be uh, highlighting your main main uh, ideas sorry sorry main important achievements and experiences and this is gonna be uh, the place you know it's it's uniquely generated um, by ADEA um, so you don't have to worry about it only things that you need to do is so Noor is asking how about a dental radiation safety certificate yes that that is gonna be a certificate if you if you are allowed to you know um, do x-rays or something like that you should add that um, in the license section. That's that's fine. Um, so again, the the bigger challenge is to highlight the six activities or four uh, four achievements. And if you have any question about that, you know, shoot me an email at dentalschoolcoach at gmail dot com. All right. So let's move to the next part of the application. Um, so let's we talked about cover sheet, and let me talk about this. Um, uh, secondary application within the AdSense application, and uh, you know to highlight that, I want to take you to the application page itself. So, I want to take you to the profile that I created, and I want to show you. Um, let's go to program materials. So I'm gonna select a school. Um, that's a Boston University. So once I, once I discuss this, I'm going to go back to academic materials. I know that I have not covered that section, and I want to talk about this in detail. So I'm, I'm on Boston University's um, dental school page within the ASSIS application. So if you're following along, uh, the more important thing that I want you to know about this um, application is that ASSIS just made it much easier for you to follow what are the requirements of the school, in this in this section, so it's it's a good idea. For, you know, it's it wasn't there before. Um, I had to buy this AdSense ADEA guidebook, which has all the prerequisites um, or the information about the school. So this is the prerequisites of the school. Uh, it's mentioned here. So if you if you type it in in your uh, transcript, they should be able to match if you have uh, these courses. And then the question itself. So this is this is where the fun begins. This was not part of the AdSys application last year. This is just added this year uh, in the new application. Uh, you can say you can also see the deadline when uh, when they are looking uh, when they are looking at uh, the school. So you can also look at the deadline. But going back to the question. Um, so AdSys has added a few things in this application. They want, uh, they're, they're asking schools to add their supplemental information in the AdSense application. So for example, in, in right here, they're asking you to talk about why are you applying to Boston University. Before, before this year, this was a question asked during, you know, after you submitted your application and Boston would select a few students to send the supplementals application to and they would you know they would ask you about these questions but now they're asking it directly in the access application and then they're asking two questions they're asking why do you want to come to Boston University 
And the second question is, think about your interest, active, you know, envision yourself as a future dental student. Think about your interest, activities, experience, and characteristics. When you are a dental student, how will you contribute to your class, school, and community? So this quite, you know, these questions are, um, are unique to Boston University, but a few other schools have their own question. I put together a document where um, you are going to see all the questions that are mentioned in this ADSYS application, uh, you know, outside of the specific regular secondary applications. Uh, I put together an Excel spreadsheet, and if you, if you decide to work with me with those supplemental applications, you know, I have, um, uh, I have added links to the PayPal so you can, you know, pay and work with me. But going back to the questions, <coughs> this is very new. And I want to make sure that you are filling this out appropriately. So, how do you research about a school to talk? You know, when they ask you why Boston University or why NYU, um, usually the school websites are not sufficient. But Boston University is a very good university. It has a lot of, uh, you know, it, it's pretty established. It its website is pretty good. So, let me take you to Boston University Dental School website. So you're going to see dental school at Boston University. <laughs> um, and when you come here, you're going to search in the about page. And you can see, you know, there's a video. Sorry, it's, it's loading. There's a video that you can see in the in the dental school website, and you can see some of the activities that they're doing. This is, you know, these are quite sufficient, and you can also look at the, uh, you know, the community ha it has Boston University, um, and you can also look at the research activities that they're doing. So, all these are pr gonna provide you sufficient information. And, you know, if you feel like okay, I want to make sure that I'm writing something specific to Boston University. I recommend going to their Facebook page. So Boston University should have a Facebook page that you can go to. So for example, I'm going to their Facebook page. And what you need to do is basically go through their Facebook page, look at some of the news that they have posted on their website. And they have additional videos that they're gonna post on their website that you can listen to and take notes for. Um, Let me turn it off. I don't want to get distracted. Um, so you know, when you're on this Facebook of the Boston University website, you are going to kind of uh, looking at what are some of the activities they're doing. So you know, they from time to time they're talking about, let's say, you know, like working with HSDA, Hispanic Student uh, Dental Association. If, so if you're Hispanic and you want to participate in this activity, you can talk about that. Um, and then you know talking about other things that they mention sometimes um, sometimes they mention about the research project or some kind of like uh, PR news that they they have been highlighting uh, they always put that on their Facebook page so for example I'm gonna go to UCLA uh, School of Dentistry and UCLA website is not very useful <clears throat> so I recommend going to UCLA and kind of like looking at their website to see so look at that they have they're talking about you know how they are providing services to 500,000 children in Los Angeles County it's county they also talk about a research that you know UCLA is doing medical project um, and other you know other things like uh, you know mice you know some research activity that they're doing so if you're really really interested if you want to point out a specific detail about the schools in their you know in their supplemental information, this is the way to go. This is the, the place you're going to do research and kind of find out what you need to, you know, you need to discuss in your, um, in that supplemental application. All right, so, so far, so good. Do you have any question about the supplemental applications that are part of the ADSYS application this year? And I believe UCLA is not one of the schools that are going to, you know, that is going to ask you to submit a supplemental application within um, you know, within the access application, but they're going to ask it to a few people. I think 
a few individual after they uh, after you submit your application and they're gonna send you a letter uh, asking you to submit the secondary application alrighty so before moving to the next section which is the academic uh, section and uh, you know where you talk about your transcript and, uh, and GPA do you have any question type it in the chat box or ask it in a text message okay so if you are you know if you don't have any question let's go to the academic history section so high school attended or college attended those are um, you know those are pretty straightforward you know talk about your high school where you went and then college attended kind of added at a college you know it's pretty simple transcript entry so this is where a lot of people have question you know um, in terms of transcript everyone should know how to how to calculate your transcript if you don't know how to calculate your uh, GPA in this in that application go to this website the ADEA website um, go to the academic history and they have a good video that shows you what you need to do like what are some of the requisites you know prerequisites for dental school they also talk about transcript there are a lot lot of frequently asked questions that they mention so for example how do i indicate an ap class it's going to be in your you know it's going to be in your transcript um, so how do i list a lab you know if you're working in a lab and you're getting credit for it you're going to mention that you know this is a really helpful faq page if you have any question about how to how to um, let's say calculate your gpa calculate your uh, you know calculate gpa in different schools what to do about that you know shoot me an email at let me let me type my email address right in the chat so that you can send me an email whenever you have a question dental school coach at gmail.com all right dental school coach at gmail.com send me an email uh, so as long as you have not submitted your uh, your application you should be able to go back and edit your application uh, you should be able to change you know change some of the information you provided in the course um, so you know if you have already also taken classes through military it's also provided uh, and once you're done submitting an application let's say in the summer you have taken some courses um, ads, you know, and you can talk about that in the planned course section. What are some of the courses you are planning? You can go back after you submit it. Let's say, let's say in August or September, you wanna update your application with the newest GPA. You can do that through this, you know, through the, your application page. Um, so aside from that, there isn't much to discuss within, you know, within the education or academic history page now now I'm gonna discuss a few things that I've gotten you know from my student uh, questions that I've gotten from my students I've already went over the difference between manual dexterity um, in the access application versus how to write it in the personal statement I talked about how to talk about your volunteer activities description um, or extracurricular activities description uh, in the in the access application versus in the personal statement i've also covered what to do in the supporting information page we pretty much covered the personal information academic history supporting information and, and program materials so some of the other questions that i repeatedly get is like what you know how many schools should i apply to the average number of schools that people apply to is 13 you know average number is 13 to 15. so you know it varies year to year but that's a safe number to to work with if you have more schools that you want to apply to that's okay but I feel that it's it's overdoing it if you are applying to more than 15 schools I think you know you should review what schools you're applying to and kind of like revisit uh, your thought about that school okay do some more research go to the website you maybe call up the schools and find out uh, what are some of the you know what are some of the good things about this school because I don't want you to apply to a school and you don't have any shot at getting into that school so for example if your gpa is low and some schools require a high gpa they're going to reject you right then and there they're not even going to look at your application so there's no point applying to harvard or columbia if you're if you have a low gpa 
And at the same at the same time, I also want to mention that if you have a really high GPA, so 3.7, 3.8, and some school, let's say Western or or uh, you know some other school that are on the lower end of the of the school uh, selection, uh, Western is one, and then the other school would be University of New England. You know some schools that are super easy to get into. Uh, you know you may have a you you may get rejected because your your GPA is too high for them or if you're coming from a good school you know, you know if you're coming from let's say school like Columbia Harvard or or Penn as an undergraduate um, or even UCLA USC uh, school like that you 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 know you even if your GPA is slightly on the lower end it's your school matters in the application process so you know a brand school is site you know it's it's looked upon as a better you know you you have some advantage if you're coming coming from a good school. Let's just let's just put it that way. Um, aside from that, you know I've covered pretty much every single thing that I got questions about. And if you have any question, you know this is the time to type it in the chat box and kind of like ask it, you know ask it um, uh, right now. If you wanna you know if you want to ask at a later time, you can definitely. Uh, but you know it's gonna be through an email. Um, so if you have any question, again, type it in the chat box. I'm really, really happy that I'm able to cover some of the topics that I wanted to cover within you know, under 60 minutes. So if you don't have any question, I want to take you to my homepage uh, where you can get you know, more information about some of the services that I provide. So for example, I do have personal statement review service, which is the most popular service. And the next popular service is the mock interview service. I've gotten a lot of, um, you know, I've gotten a lot of students last two years. Uh, about personal statement and mock interview. Who wants to, you know, who want to improve their chances in getting to the, into getting into dental school? Um, I also provide help with secondary application. So if you are, you know, if you have any question about these services, definitely feel free to reach out to me. How many extracurricular activities? Okay, I'm getting a question. How many extracurricular activities are limited for the professional experience section? So you don't have any limitation. You can add as many activities as you want to, but I recommend keeping it under ten because. After you know, after ten activities, it's bigger, it just becomes too many. Um, but the other caveat is that you have six activities and extracurricular uh, activities that you can highlight. You know, six activities in the experience section. So you have to be wise about what activities you are selecting. So that's you know that's one of the more important important discussion topic. All right, so let's go back to the page. Um, you know, ask your question. Ask you know, go to the chat box. Ask your question. This is a good time to ask if you have any question. I'm gonna hang out for maybe five, ten more minutes to see if you have any question, um, and I can answer that in the live call. And at the same time, I wanna I wanna also take you back to the the web page where you can see all the all the services that I provide, and kind of you know see what services is something that you need. So a lot of people have who have 25 to 30 schools in their list. Um, I highly encourage you to look into the school selection service. We, you know, I promise you that we'll get down to about 15 to 16 schools for you so that you can save about, you know, $1,000 to $2,000 if you have a lot of schools on your list. In addition to that, if you need any help in terms of um, the application process or, uh, you know, you just want to talk it out, there is one-on-one -on -one consultation service that you can you can get from me. I'm also providing a, s a summary edit. So in terms of, um, right, so in terms of if you need any help uh, with the description of your professional summaries and selecting the, the most useful activities or most important activities and experiences, you know, this is the, this is the service you should get. Um, and going back to school selection service, Tommy Lau is asking, what are some of the out-of-state friendly public schools? So there are some out-of-state out friendly public schools that I can mention right now. Um, for example, University of Connecticut. It accepts about 25 to 30 percent student um, from out-of-state. Rutgers is also pretty good. They also accept 25 to 30 percent. They're public. And then you have uh, University of Maryland, which also accepts about 40 percent students out of state. Uh, it's also a public school. Then in the California system, you know, UCLA is pretty bad. They only accept 90% student in state and then maybe 10% out of state. So if you're applying to UCLA, you probably have, excuse me, you probably have a very low chance. UCSF, on the other hand, is better in terms of taking out of state student. Uh, it takes about 
I would say 25 to 30 percent student. So the public schools that are you know accepting out of state student, they are going to be taking um, you know taking maybe 25 to 30 percent student. So you know you, you have some shots. So maybe every one out of four students have a shot at getting accepted um, if you are from out of state. But aside from those schools, you know, I don't know many schools that are kind of like out of state friendly. So I'm going to look into my book, which is the ADA book. I'm going to tell you right now which schools I think are, um, are good in terms of, um, you know, out of state friendliness. Uh, so I'm seeing some other schools like, as I mentioned, you know, University of Colorado. I don't know if it's a private school, but it definitely takes a lot of students from out of state. Um, and then University of Iowa, it takes about 30% out of state. Um, so, you know, those are some of the schools that you, you think you can think of. Uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, it's a, it's a public school. It takes about 30% student out of state. So you can, you can take a look into that. Um, and there are, there are a few other schools, you know, <clears throat> so again, if you have any, any, any question about what schools are are good um, in terms of out of state friendliness you can you can look into those so Oregon health and he health and science University of school sorry Oregon health and science University School of Dentistry they take about 30 percent student out of state so again if you're looking at a public school and looking at its out of state friendliness um, you don't have much luck except more than like 20 to 25 percent uh, chance in the in those schools um, so if you're, you know, if you're looking at those public school, you are paying out of state tuition for the first year, and then you can get a state residency in, from the next, you know, for the next three years, you can pay uh, the in-state tuition. So I'm going to stop recording, but I'm still hanging out right here on the webinar. If you have any question, this is a good time to ask, you know, ask it out loud, kind of, kind of show me you know, what are some of the questions you have, um, and, you know, what are some of the, some of the things you want to know about the application process. And again, thank you so much for joining. Um, I see that, you know, a few students have joined uh, from a different, you know, from different uh, places in the, in the U.S., and I really, really, really admire your dedication um, to, <clears throat> to, you know, getting into that dental school. All right. So someone is asking about, would you mind giving us some more example of low GPA accepting school? Yes, I can definitely do that. So let me get my book um, from my table and let me get, give you some schools that you can look into if you have a low GPA. So for example, um, all right, some low GPA accepting schools. Um, let me, you know what, let me, type that into the chat box so it's easy for for you to see so low gpa except accepting schools uh esdo is a is a low gpa school arizona school of dental and oral health uh midwestern arizona western um howard um Howard is if you are an African American, you have a better shot, and also Mihari, you have a better shot in those schools. Um, some other schools are um, Tufts, Lecom, <coughs> um, if you, you know, Boston University has a, uh, if, you, if your GPA is around 3.3-ish, ish, that's that's when Boston University is a good school, um, <coughs> and then other schools that I think uh, are good in terms of low GPA, you can look into MUSC if you are a South Carolina resident, if you are a South Carolina resident. Really, really easy school to get into. Um, as I said, Mihari is a good school. And then you have Roseman. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so those are those are what schools I have on my list that are uh, friendly towards, you know, they're friendly towards school that are, you know, schools that are friendly towards low GPA. So, you know, those should be schools that you, you should be applying to if you have a low GPA. Any other question? And again, if you if you get my school selection service, um, you know, I go in depth about, uh, you know, whether those schools take out community college classes, uh, whether those schools uh, have specific requirements. So for some of the schools require you to take additional college level courses such as uh, STAT or English. So you need to, you know, know all the details before you kind of apply to the schools. So make sure that you're applying to Well, again, no, no, there, there is no really good answer to that. Where you know, like in terms of programs, um, from a from a research pr perspective, Penn, Columbia, and Harvard, and UCLA and UCSF, those are the known research school in the country. Uh, from a clinical perspective, most of the schools are going to prepare you for a clinical, um, you know, a clinical degree. So most of the schools, you know, they're going to focus on making you prepared uh, from a clinical perspective. Um, and, and it really depends on what kind of program you're you're gonna thrive at. So some people, some schools have lecture-based classes. Some schools have, you know, case-based classes. Um, so you know, you have to decide what format of learning works better for you, and kind of select the program. So I know the USC is a case-based program. Uh, it highly emphasizes on you know, kind of like dental cases and uh, some of the. Uh, you know some of the cases that uh, you would see as a as a dentist in the future. So if you you know if you learn more from a de uh, from a case perspective, that's your school to go to. Uh, if you learn more of a lecture setting, you know you have other schools that provide just pure lecture. Some schools combine both of them, lecture plus case studies. So I think you know those are mentioned in the school website, and um, you know that's an additional level of level of detail that you have to research about the schools when when you're you know when you're looking to the school website and kind of like talking to the students. Any more questions? This is your chance to talk, uh, you know, talk out loud with me, ask any question. I'm going to be hanging out for another two more minutes. And then after that, I'm going to close out the webinar. Uh, and then once the webinar is closed, this, uh, you know, this is going to be um, posted on the YouTube. Um, you know, it's going to be posted on YouTube. Um, and you can you can watch it on you know on YouTube uh, with the link. I'm gonna send out the link to my to my student, also to my email list. And after that, you know this is gonna be available to the public. I wanted to I wanted to you know thank you for being on my email list and also you know being a paid student because I really appreciate uh, the the dedication and the commitment that you have towards applying to dental school. And it's really really important that you know you are committed to this career. And you know, I I could not fulfill my dream to go to dental school. So you are the people that really helped me to you know keep my dream alive. All right. With that said, you know, if you don't have any question, I'm gonna stop the uh, streaming. And um, you know, really really thank you for joining. And I look forward to talking to you more on my email, which I'm gonna post again. It's dentalschoolcoach at gmail dot com. Thank you so much.